Peter today. We did First Peter, and this is amazing stuff. The Bible is the, the world's bestseller by far. There's no book that's been worked on like the Bible. It's absolutely phenomenal. The work that's there on the computers, the commentaries. Pe people have spent their lives dedicated to reading these extraordinary words of the Bible. And so we're making our attempt at that today in Second Peter. I'm reading from the New American Standard Version, which is as good as any. RSV is good. RV is good. The... Roman Catholic Bible, NAB, does very well. Some of the paraphrases can be very good and also quite bad. But I would remind you that in 1535, Tyndale, who got burned at the stake for this, rendered John 1.1 1, 1, as all things were made through it. Not him. All things were made through it. In the beginning was the word, little w. All things were made through it. Tyndale cost him his life. Church didn't like that because they was taking away their proof text for a second member of the Godhead. So we're working against that as best we can. And we're having more fun with the Bible reading it this way than we did in my Church of England days for 20 years when we didn't know anything about anything. We didn't. I was there. I'm not lying to you. I sat there in that church for 20 years. I didn't know any of these discussions. Something has happened to change our minds. And now the Bible has become a very interesting book because it's all about immortality, living forever. It's not about, imagine soccer, being a game where you try to kick the ball as high as you can into the air. That's silly. Everybody knows that's not true. No, you're forward-looking to the kingdom, you enter the kingdom, and you gain the life of the age to come for our Hebrew-speaking friends out there, the Chaye Olam, the life of the age. And the rabbi said, if it's the life of the age, the Chaye Olam in Daniel 12, then it's the life of the age to come, which is 41 times in the New Testament. Now I think about going to heaven, my own cousin, Notorious cousin J.T. Robinson at Cambridge said, he was a professor of New Testament, he said, heaven and the Bible is nowhere the destination of the dying. What? Excuse me? All my friends who trips into church Sunday by Sunday are told the opposite. This is serious stuff. You don't want to be telling untruth about the Bible. You don't want to do that. So heaven in the Bible is not where people go. They're going to inherit the earth, this beautiful earth. It's Daniel 7. Daniel 7, read to the children about every 10 minutes all day long, and they'll never be misled. Under the whole heaven will be the kingdom of God, and you are the kingdom. Fear not, little flock, Jesus said to his people. It is your Father's delighted pleasure, his great pleasure, to give you the kingdom. What? Rule the world? Yes. Nothing about playing harps on pink clouds in heaven. So these are the points that you get over to your friend at the checkout counter, at the bank, wherever it is, and people are interested in these things. As the more we can get us out there, the more friends we'll make. I tell you, we have a new person listening yes. in from Poland. Good. I think that's our first yeah, Poland Yeah, it may be. <laughs> Polish <Polander>. person. <laughs> Polish person, that's wonderful. Polander, yeah. yeah. Good, well Poland, you know, where, is where the Unitarians, the Rakovians, suffered. They had a, a college there for how long? For many years, 100 years. 100 years. 100 years. They had 1,000 students coming to learn the one God in Poland, in Raqqa. We hope to go there, God willing, in, in, in the beginning of next year sometime. So, Poland is a hotbed of Unitarianism. Not now, probably, but even the king, Sigismund III, allowed Polish Unitarians to be genuine. In other places, they were kicked out as impossible heretics. That's wonderful. Well, we're so thrilled. Good. Thank you so much. Thrilled to know of your existence. Okay, anything else we want to say? Sarah, you have a study Bible there. What does uh, Ryrie say about Second Peter at the beginning? Uh, Just a historical note. summarizes that this letter is a reminder of the truth of Christianity yeah. as opposed to the heresies of false teachers. Yeah. Important passages include those concerning the transfiguration, 1, 16 to 18, the yes. inspiration of scripture, 121, and the certainty of the second coming of Christ, 3, 4 through 10. Wonderful. Excellent summary. Some of these study Bibles have good material. So, the transfiguration we're going to be studying, looking at, and the certainty of the second coming, although it's been very much delayed. I don't think Jesus himself, he said that. He didn't know the long stretches of time. They didn't think it would be 2,000 years, and here we are still waiting. And Peter says, well, a day with God is like a 1,000 years. And so God is not thinking quite as we are in time periods, but that second coming is certain. There's only one second coming. Tell your friends not to. 
It's a falsehood to get up in the morning and believe that Christ can come back today and will come back again seven years later. That's wrong. Yes, the seven-year period is future. That's wonderful. But there's only one parousia. I'm using the Greek word for second coming, parousia. There's only one of those, and it's spectacular and visible. And so if your friends happen to be in the JWs who think that the second coming was in 1878, take your pick, 1878, 1914, 1918, or 2025, <laughs> take your pick. This is a madhouse. This is dementia. We don't need that. No, one second coming, one visible return of Christ to establish the kingdom. Okay, transfiguration I'm and what else was there? <coughs> Something else. You got a, a comment already? No, no. I, I'm my comment. It's in the future. It hasn't happened yet. Mm -hmm. It's not invisibly here somewhere. No. Mm -hmm. No, and Jesus warned against that. He said, don't go out in the wilderness if they say he's out here in the wilderness or he's over there in some secret place. Don't believe it. Are you ready not to believe what people say, especially preachers? Do you know there is such a thing as a fake preacher who lies to you? No, not intentionally. He just doesn't know what he's talking about. So you must discern as the public. We're not always good at that. My, uh, my mm -hmm. New Living has an interesting uh, introductory yes. note. Mm -hmm. uh, Second Peter teaches the audience to oppose internal en enemies yes. with knowledge of the truth. Good. Knowledge is the prominent theme of this letter and the best antidote for heresies. Isn't that good? Knowledge. Good. Knowledge. That awful thing called head knowledge. That boring thing called head knowledge. Oh, give me heart. Emotion. Well, there's nothing wrong with emotion. But knowledge as... The NLT note says, that's the New Living Translation, a good paraphrase, here and there, very good. And it warns us then that knowledge is a key thing for Peter. Now you're listening to Jesus, his student in Peter. He reflects what he heard from Messiah Jesus for hours, and knowledge, the Greek word gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S, gnosis, knowledge, is very important. So what's your major knowledge text in the Bible? Isaiah 53, 11. What does that say? Isaiah 53, 11. This is a much under-preached text. What does it say? Isaiah 53, 11. He wow. saved us by his own. Mm. Yes. <clears throat> it says, after he has suffered, yes. he will see the light of life mm -hmm. and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many. That's exactly mm -hmm. right. He's referring to the righteous servant who is Messiah. By his knowledge, he will make many right rather than wrong. That awful word righteous means you're right rather than wrong. By his knowledge. And so people say, well, that must be by our knowing, knowing him. No, no. The, the genitive there is um, objective, sorry, subjective. The knowledge that Jesus has, subjective genitive, you want to be technical, no need to be. The knowledge that Jesus has is saving. And by that knowledge, he saves people. Of course, because he spent hours preaching and saying if you've got ears to hear please listen especially also, the parents because the by knowledge of him mm -hmm. is also right yes the knowledge of by him is correct yes so it doesn't say that it just says by his yes. knowledge mm -hmm. the so righteous one my servant yeah, will knowledge. justify the name yeah the sense there is the knowledge that he gave out by his knowledge not us knowing him it's a subjective genesis the knowledge that Jesus had is saving. Well, yes. that yeah. Okay. So that's uh, a very As important. As opposed to just yeah. accepting mm -hmm. his name and yes. the, vaguely. You're done. Yes. Yeah. You you're done. Some... Right. You aren't done because that's when you begin the process of the race, which ends at the end. The parable of the sower is <laughs> devastating. As I was translating that again, every word of it is, is very breathtakingly significant, the parable of the sower. And Peter would have this in mind as he wrote all of this excellent second letter here. So, we've got Simon Peter, that's his name, one of the twelve. You remember the occasion where Jesus selected from all of his students, disciples, twelve of them to be apostles. And he named Peter as the leading apostle. First in the list is Peter. He was the outspoken one who tragically, of course, abandoned Jesus at the crucifixion and ran away. And they said to him, you sound like a Galilean. Your accent gives you away. I don't know what you're talking about, Peter said. I don't know anything about Jesus. I'm out of here. However, he recovered, and it says there, in the words of Jesus somewhere, that when you recover, when you repent, you are to strengthen your brothers. Well, he's doing that through these letters, 
Christ today. Although, so, if I could yes. speak for Peter, hmm? if I could speak for Peter, yes. he, he was courageous yes. to uh, try and take on a whole, oh, yes. a whole army of uh, uh, yep. what, what are they? <coughs> soldiers who arrested Jesus. Yeah, until he ran away. <laughs> yes. He no, was he's... willing to die right there. I mean, they could have killed him. Yes. Yeah. And of course then he, he lied about not knowing Jesus, about failing to know Jesus. He lied about that. And then when he realized what had happened, the cock, a cock, a rooster, crowed three times. And Jesus had predicted, when that happens, you will have denied me, you will have disowned me. I like that word, you will have disowned me. He did, he disowned him. When he realized what he'd done, what happened? He went out and wept bitterly, sobbed, realizing what he'd done. Finally repented, turned around, wrote these wonderful books, and then died, probably crucified upside down. How would you like to be crucified upside down? You wouldn't want to be crucified at all. Bad enough going to the dentist. To be crucified is much worse, and to be crucified upside down is cruel. All of which is to say there is a devil externally there, you're not the devil, that's a big falsehood. There's an external devil who is master of a lot of deception. You've only got to switch on the news to hear the infighting and the struggle and the abuse. Nothing much has changed. Okay, so Simon Peter, Shimon Peter, Petros, a bondservant, an apostle of Jesus Messiah, a slave, bondservant. You're supposed to do what you're told if you're the slave of the master, and Peter certainly did that when he recovered and repented and so on. Uh, verse 2, or no, verse 1, let me do the rest of it. To those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours, as Peter's, by the righteousness of our God and Saviour Jesus Christ. Uh-oh, our God and Saviour Jesus Christ. I don't think so. There's a grammatical rule there that says if you only have one article, then it must be one person. So this must be God and Saviour. Jesus is both proof God right and Saviour. Proof, right, proof there. right there. That Jesus is God. Right. Right there. But the but second verse. Close the book. <laughs> We're done. The second verse contradicts it then. The <laughs> second verse says, grace and peace be multiplied. I like that. Multiplied to you, not just added, in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Okay, so there the and forces it to two people. Okay, the other rule, I mean, this is the madness of scholarship, false scholarship, which will argue and find grammatical points that are completely beyond the public anyway, to show that Jesus is God. So what you have in mind is 2 Thessalonians 1.12. At this point, I hate to even have to mention it, but 2 Thessalonians 1.12 in regard to that first verse, You'll find this in 2 Thessalonians, I think, unless I got the wrong Thessalonians, I don't think I did. 2 Thessalonians, and that's somewhere. 112, what do you got there? Actually, I'm looking up Titus 2.13, which is in okay. the margin, yes. which mentions uh, looking for the hope and appearing of the right. glory of our great God and Savior. Right, and the King Savior. James gets that one right. The, the God glory and of... Uh, God and our Saviour Jesus Christ is the right rendering there. So that helps us. The King James has that one right. God and Jesus are distinct persons. And in 2 Thessalonians 1.12, 1, 12, you have a nice one. The name of our Lord Jesus will be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Good. That's wonderful. Now, if you render that one then, so that the name of our Lord Jesus will be glorified in you, and you and him according to the grace of our God and Lord Jesus Christ. On their rule, you should do that. Mm. So the word and is put in italics correctly. The word the. Yes. They added the. They added the. But Sorry. They didn't add, they add the. the. Right. They added the word the. And so they got the right idea here. According to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. According to their own rule, which doesn't work, it should be according to the grace of our God and Lord Jesus Christ. That's the way the rule should work. Well, they were clever enough to see that doesn't make much sense. Our God and Lord Jesus Christ, 
So he's now God, he's our God and Lord. It's all nonsense. This is dementia, folks. We don't need that. Because Jews are horrified at this idea, and Muslims, by the million, billion or whatever it is, are horrified at this idea. So the whole world is torn apart by the Trinitarian notion that God is really three, but really one. So tell your Methodist friends when they go to church, what do they mean when they say the Son is begotten, not made? What does that mean? I've asked my friends. They don't know. No idea. But you're reciting it every Sunday. What does it mean? I don't know. Mindless groupthink. Is it Carson Tucker? Is that his name? Tucker, He's Tucker Carlson. Carlson. Yeah. Something like that. His slogan is that he's pledged to all forms to oppose all forms of pomposity and groupthink. Are you? What are you doing to help these masses of people who are not thinking? Because it could turn out to be very bad for them. Um, um, Omar has a comment. He yeah. says that the Jerusalem Bible says um, of our God and of the Savior Jesus good. Christ. That's wonderful. It's good. That's the Roman Catholic Bible. They did well there. The New Jerusalem Bible, or the old one, either one probably gets it right. But Second Thessalonians <coughs> one twelve then is your antidote, if you like. If you follow their rule, you should really read that as grace of our God and Lord. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, just for the record, yes. Ehrman, if anyone's interested, mm -hmm. yeah. the Orthodox Baruch mm -hmm. Scripture, mm -hmm. he takes this variation, he calls it, of God, mm -hmm. uh, our Lord Jesus, to the third century. Yes. This omission was not an accident. It's confirmed by similar modifications in the same manuscript. Mm -hmm. So in the same manuscript, they were changing it to make Jesus God. They are. Oh, they did that on purpose. Oh, yes. Yes. Wow. Oh, they fiddled the books. Oh, yeah. they fiddled the books. I need to write an article. The Orthodox about that. Corruption. The Orthodox Corruption for our young up and coming scholars. The Orthodox Corruption of Scripture by uh, Ehrman, who is not a believer, I hate to tell you now. He's an agnostic. But he's smart enough to see where the words were fiddled. So you might want to write an article on. Peril from the pulpit. Peril from the pulpit. How translations and traditions fiddled the books. They did. They didn't stop at that. They fiddled the books. Don't want to do that. That's called forgery. That's a crime. Mom's reading the Spanish. Yes. Please. Nuestro Dios y Salvador Jesucristo. Yes. So that's wrong then, right? Yeah. Nuestro Dios. Oh, right. oh, yeah. They haven't got it right. It should be Nuestro Dios. It should be. Nuestro Yes. Yeah. yeah. Two. And so Second Thessalonians, are you reading there from Second Thessalonians or Peter? No, no, the, the, the one in Peter. Peter right, right, right. Yep. Well, the antidote, as I'm repeating here, is Second Thessalonians 1.12, where if you applied their wrong rule, then you'd have our God and Jesus as the same person. <coughs> that doesn't sound right, even to a Trinitarian, so that helps then. Sorry to be technical there, but what can you do? This is called knowledge, and a little knowledge is not well, a bad thing. No, and note the early corruption of Scripture. Yeah. Third century, that's a hundred years before Nicaea. Right. Right. That's crazy. It is. There is a corruption. Okay, so this is uh, first two. Well, that's verse first two. one. That's you know, first one. <laughs> Have we got time to do verse two? Sarah. What does verse two say? Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Mm -hmm. We know that His divine power has granted us everything necessary in relation to life and godliness yes. through the knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and virtue. Yes. Knowledge is key. Mm -hmm. okay. And that mine has true knowledge. Yes. That's fine. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, yes. so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, mm -hmm. having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Good. Okay, let's just pause there, ma'am. We're trying to escape the corruption. Corruption is a bad thing, isn't it? Nobody likes to be corrupted. Well, we just read a corruption. We just read a corruption. Corruption in any form, corrupting of food that was good and now isn't so good, corrupting in any field, corrupt politics, fake news, all the rest of it. 
That's all due to the lust that's in the world. That's the desire for things that are evil. So knowledge is key, isn't it right there? The word knowledge is going to occur three times in this chapter. The knowledge, so that's Isaiah 53, 11. By his knowledge, Jesus vindicates us, saves us, makes us right rather than wrong. Now, that's not to say we shouldn't have emotion in our faith. Of course we can do that. But what if we just play out of our emotions with no knowledge? Then the text in Hosea comes into place, which says, my people are destroyed for lack of emotion. No. They're destroyed for a lack of knowledge. What one is that? Hosea somewhere, sir? That's four, a good six, one. Four, six, four. Four, six, six, two. Four, five, five, good text to keep in mind as you do your Hubble yeah. verses there. Mm-hmm. Anyway, knowledge. Hosea 4 6. 4 6. Read that for us, please. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being my priest. Since you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. That's awful. Because you have rejected knowledge, you're not going to be my priests and kings, it was said to Israel. The same is true in the New Testament. If you're going to say no to knowledge, then you are disqualified as a priest king. That's very threatening. You know, if you're God, you can make the rules. You have that right. He can make the rules. Paul says the same thing to his fellow Israelites in Romans 10. Yes. What's the verse you have in mind there? That's a good one. 10.3, I think. Yes. Uh, Read that for us. They have zeal, but they lack knowledge. A lot of zeal. But zeal by itself, burning zeal, enthusiasm, excitement, is useless without knowledge. Also Hosea 4.4. In the Which same says? chapter. Yeah. So the people without understanding are ruined. Do you want to be ruined? Then you say, I don't need all that knowledge, all that head knowledge. That's the wrong way to go. Don't go there. Yes, it's fine to have emotion, but you better have proper instruction. And it needs to be right. Not, for instance, that you're to keep the holy days and the Sabbath religiously, because that's part of the old covenant. Just been dealing with the with the worldwide Church of God people, and it was pointing, I was trying to point out to them. But the Ten Commandments are actually said to be Old Testament in the letter, not for us. Even the Ten are the Old Covenant, and the Sabbath is the sign of the Old Covenant. So you want to be in the Old Covenant? Go for it. Keep your Sabbath. All right, you're telling God, I believe in the Old Covenant. That's wrong. We have to move into the New Covenant. So there's much knowledge that needs to be clarified. Okay. So I have a question on verse 2, yes. 3, I guess. Because mm-hmm. it says, seeing that his divine power has granted to us yes. everything pertaining to life and godliness yes. through the knowledge of him who called us. So which comes first, him granting us the divine power mm-hmm. or us seeking knowledge? Yes. I mean, well, that's, that's uh, the, always we, the two sides of the coin. We seek it? the knowledge and he gives us the divine power yeah. or his divine power is there to help us understand. Both, I think. I think two sides of the same <coughs> coin. Calvinism stresses the one side, that God does it all and you do nothing, you know, you don't make any choices. And the Bible seems to tell us clearly that you have to cooperate with God. So that, that's, that's an unanswerable question, I think, entirely. God has given us the knowledge by some gracious act of his. We stumble on that. I don't think we can praise ourselves. Although I will tell you, in the parable of the sower, the good seed fell on rich soil. And how does Jesus interpret that? The rich soil is those who receive the message in a good and honest heart. They did that. Now how that came to be is, is inscrutable. Was that in your genes? Something you did well. Otherwise, it's pure Calvinism. It's all fatalism, right? I don't think that's right because there's too much. So the answer to your question is both sides of the coin. Where how, Exactly how that works in every individual case, I don't think we can possibly say. I am impressed with Jesus saying they received the word of the kingdom, the gospel, in a good and honest heart. It's Luke 8, which is a key chapter that created about the parables. So, so they did have a good and honest heart. What about the Bereans? Dr. Luke, what did he say about them? He said that they were more noble than the people in Thessalonica. They had a more liberal in the best sense a more open-minded approach to life, and they searched the scriptures daily to see if these things were true, and guess what? They became believers. 
We didn't do that in the Church of England days. The idea of searching the scriptures. We didn't know anything about that. So there is a nobility of mind which is acquired, a royal sort of approach, a, a good investigating mind. And some of us have had to stumble badly before getting on to better knowledge, I think. And none of us has it entirely right. Well, it's still listening to the comments of you good folk out there. But that's a great question. I think one can't answer it entirely. Two sides of the coin, though. We often said that in class in the college, in answer to questions. There are two sides of that coin. Paul will stress one side, and you think, that's all he knows. Paul has a mind which goes for one point, and he'll make a point which makes you think that this is to the exclusion of everything else. It's not, because elsewhere, he'll make the other side of the coin. So the art is to put the two sides of the coins together and mesh them. Think about that. The process seems yes. to be God calls, right? God yes. Calls. So yes. God wants everyone to be saved. Yes. So he has to call everyone. He does. Somehow, yes. some way. But some people and, yeah. do seek him <clears throat> and want to know. Yes. And other people are just know. hit with it. <laughs> like, whoa, yes. I wasn't even searching. And Lots where did this come from? Yeah. And and yes. the calling yeah. now in the church age, yeah. if you want to call it, yes. uh, after the cross, is us. That's yeah. why it's so important. Yeah. Our break commission work, right? Yes. Because we we're going to all be held to account. Absolutely. And the and if we want to get technical about the process, mm. which it sounds like the question is, mm. uh, I always go to the Ephesians one. Mm -hmm. I like. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's see. It says. Uh, 1 12 mm -hmm. we were the first to put our hope in Christ yes verse 13 you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth Absolutely. so that's the calling yes the gospel of your salvation yes then what happened you believed mm -hmm. and then what happened you were sealed mm -hmm. with, with the, the promise of the Holy Spirit as a yeah. down came yeah so yeah. there's always the calling somehow some yeah. way yes and then what happens next? Your reception. That fertile ground thing. That's right. It's the parable, so it's just brilliant. It should be preached a lot. <clears throat> and that text in Ephesians, the better translation at the end there, would be not the promised spirit, but the spirit of the promise of the kingdom. It's the spirit of the promise. Mm. The spirit, and the essence of this Holy Spirit, is the promise of the kingdom. And it's also promised Holy Spirit, but it's the spirit of the promise in Ephesians, what was that? 1.13. That's, that's a very good one. 1.13. And 14, which is a down payment on yes. our future inheritance good. until the redemption of God's own position yes. to the praise of His glory. To the praise of His glory. glory. Right. Until is the key word in the Bible. Until is the point up to which all the great things will eventually happen at the end of the untils. That's good. Yeah, we're talking about the process of salvation. How do you get immortality? That would be the thing you would expect to be discussed on Fox News endlessly, but it's not. That's and CNN. And but it's not. it says that in him, you also have to, li after listening ah. to the message of truth, that so that's where the message of truth has to be out there Absolutely. for somebody to hear it. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. Somebody has yeah. to be yeah. preaching it. Well, we're talking the process of salvation, Anthony. Yes. That's right. Um, that's what the people asked yes. at Pentecost. Yes. Right? The call went out mm -hmm. through the speaking of other languages. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they said they were struck to the heart. So let's hope that happens. Yep. By the way, they were struck, struck, struck to the heart, right? The heart. And then the question came, which yep. is that question. How do what we should get we do? Saved, what are we supposed to do? How do we yep. get saved? And of course, it wasn't just the speaking of languages, it was the very substantial sermon that Peter then gave, not in foreign languages, obviously. No, but in reaction to what in reaction saw to that, them, right. To took a thunderbolt. Like, How do I get saved? Yes. yes. And then Peter goes into yes. But if you weren't one of those people standing out there, yeah. something made you go out there and stand yes. and want to yes. hear this. Because other people were at home. The, 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 the mighty the rushing wind, wind probably. You know, what's going on? Yeah, that yes. reminds yes. me so. that we had loss of power here in Georgia for a few hours. Did you have it this week? No. no. I, I was sitting there doing my translating about 6.30 in the morning. Suddenly, the, the power flickered once and came back. Flickered twice, flickered three times, went out. I thought, this is amazing. 
Does this mean the whole American grid has gone? <laughs> Actually not. So eventually then, of course there's no telephone. It really struck me how we are utterly dependent on electricity. So we didn't know what to do. Pick up the telephone, it's dead. No light. The generator that we were kindly given by somebody 17 years ago actually is not working right now. I need to get oh, it fixed. Right. It's not going on. So it didn't go off or it didn't start up. It should have automatically. It didn't. So then we said, well, how do we know what's going on? I took my car. My car was still work. <laughs> Drove it up and nobody had any light up there. I went up to the traffic lights. What do you call that in America? Stop lights, right? Stop lights or start lights? Traffic, traffic right? lights. Is that well that work? Traffic lights. And there's a policeman there with a flashing light <coughs> directing the traffic. No traffic lights. So I'm going to ask this policeman. I thought, no, you can't do that. He's directing the traffic. Don't ask him. As I looked at the traffic lights, they came on again. And the policeman got in his car and drove off. Isn't that amazing? Of course we have a smart this is quite a lesson for me. The text is yeah. <laughs> so that's our. It's, it's a great question. And nobody knows in individual cases exactly how that works. I think we don't know. I mean, in our own case, we had to be jolted out of our complacency in the Armstrong movement. <coughs> Other people seem to stumble on it different ways. I don't know how that works. Your genes, your predisposition, influences, all of that's inscrutable. All I know is that God requires our cooperation. I like that, don't you? If God creates a human being, doesn't he have a right to use this person not as a robot? I mean, that's marvelous. So yeah. we're making a decision. You know, at, at first, mm -hmm. that question was not complex or at no. all. No. Because there was only one, yes. one way. Yes. They called them the people of the people way. People of the way. But the problem, two thousand years later, mm -hmm. it is now complex. Yes. And the question now is a legitimate question. Sure. Because you have 40,000 yes. and growing uh, ways. Yes. <laughs> so that's an yeah. issue. That's right. So it's become if I mean, Peter would so. never have dreamed, I think. No, I think not. That's why we're supposed to contend yes. for the faith once and for all delivered. Jude 1 3. Jude, the half brother of Jesus, writes there. I'm writing to you, he said, so that you struggle, you fight, you contend. That's a very rough word. Contend for the faith once and for all delivered to the same. Again, if you're God, you can set the terms like this. I don't particularly want it, by the way. I would much rather. Everybody vaguely gets saved, you know, by believing vague things. I, that would be very easy, but it may not be true. So why is Jude saying we contend for the faith once and for all delivered? Because there are fake clergy who've crept in and they're ruining everything. That's what Jude says. Okay. Back let's to... Do you want say, any comments here? No, let's see what, what people are thinking. Okay, we've got two threads of things going on here. Okay. So one is that Randy says, through the true knowledge, the yes. verse that said true knowledge, yes. not just knowledge. Epinosis. And um, Epinosis. so Epinosis. we can have a true knowledge of mm -hmm. God, not the ethereal unknown God as in Platonism. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's and exactly I said, right. yes, Randy, not the Gnostic God that was taught at the time. Absolutely right. And then Child mm -hmm. of the 80s says to me, Michelle, why does the Ethiopian Coptic Church Bible have so many Gnostic books in it. Yeah. I'm going to say I don't know, yeah. but I'll ask you. <laughs> well, <laughs> they, I, I didn't know that they had Gnostic books in. Keegan Chandler is our expert in that area. But very simply what happened was that Justin Martyr, who is a big writer in 150 AD, we have his whole discussion with a Jew called Trifo, where <coughs> Justin is trying to argue Trifo into the Christian faith. And we can see that Justin was a professional philosopher before he became converted. And what he does is to bring that Greek philosophy in with him. And so he reconstructs the faith within a new framework. And here's a quote, for instance, that does that point very well. In the middle of the second century, 150 AD, Justin Martyr composed his Apology and Dialogue with Trifo. And in these, this is not me quoting, but this is a, somebody called Purvis making this statement, the influence of philosophy on Christianity appears to be in full force. Mm -hmm. In full force. That's, that's paganism. It's GMO stuff, right? It's poison in the system. Through Justin, who's claiming to be a Christian, but he's a philosopher, he hasn't repented of that. So he's reconstructing the faith in a new framework. And then he says this, Justin discloses the nexus, the connection between pagan forms of philosophy 
the bridge by which the former, as pagan philosophy, passed over into Christianity's territory. Lots of scholars say this. Harnack, very famous scholar, they all know what went wrong. Christianity found in the Hellenic, the Greek Judaism of Alexandria, that's pagan. Alexandria was always dangerous. Egypt was always dangerous. There was pagan philosophy there. So Christianity, in its wrong form, found in this Greek influence of Alexandria the means by which, while preserving its hold on Christian and Hebrew revelation, it could yet adopt the philosophical thoughts and retain the philosophical conceptions of the day. So in other words, they said, we we're not keen on this Jewish thing. Look, this is not a good trademark. This is not going to sell any books or make any converts. Who wants to believe in a Jew? Come on. <coughs> no, what we need is this universal knowledge from pagan philosophy, Neoplatonism. Plato was a homosexual, by the way. And so they mingled the Bible with Platonic faith. That's what I got in the Church of England. I didn't know. Did we learn this in school? No. But this is massive. I, I'm not quoting one remote thing there. Yeah, King and Chandler has done good work on all that. You're adopted dealing with an adopted and adapted. Adopted and adapted, right. They adopted and adapted it. So we can say the scale of the scam is massive. The scale of the scam, right? You get so much of this on Fox News and CNN, Fox News particularly, right? Everybody's talking about fake news, lies, right? Just imagine that in church that could have happened. This seems to be the situation. I don't like that. I wish it were not. I want to believe that everybody is a jolly good chap. You say uh, everyone knows this Harnack, all the... Yes. You know, today, uh, you know, the, this week I've been contacting mm -hmm. old scholars from... Uh, Yale, Harvard, and I got a couple of responses, one. And, and they agree that good th things like a hot mean one, just like that's right, the number one, right? That's right. The, the problem is that they, it's not that they don't agree to simple things like that. The problem is getting them to agree that <coughs> what's called Christianity yes. is that crypto yes. Gnostic thing yes. you talk about. Yes, that's the real problem. Yes. That's exactly right. Here's a great statement. Pro Professor Lufs, a German, wrote this. The apologists, the apo you should know this term now, the apologists are the second century exponents of what they're calling Christianity. Justin Martyr is the key one. The apologists, which are church fathers like Justin Martyr, come to call them fathers, by the way. Yeah. The fathers. They say, well, they must be important because they're the fathers of the church. Wait a minute. Maybe they altered the faith. So, the Apologist, capital A, Apologist, which doesn't mean you're saying sorry for something, it means you're arguing <laughs> your case. <laughs> Eventually say sorry for it. <laughs> right. They uh, caused a perversion or corruption of Christianity. This is what he wrote. And he used it, this is all in German before I translate, but it's, it's, uh, the word in German is Verkehrung which happens to be an old German word, so it's a little hard to get hold of it. Some people translate it transformation, which is much less cruel. Mm -hmm. So at airports, I would find German speakers, and I would say, I want to ask you a question, I'm doing some translating work. What do you understand by Verkehrung? Oh, they say, it's an old word, but it means corruption, perversion. It's not a neutral term. So this writer, Luke, says, that these apologists in 150 AD, particularly Justin Martyr, caused a perversion of Christianity into a philosophical teaching. I didn't write this, listen to what Luke says. Specifically, that understanding of Christ, the new one that they invented, affected the later development of Christianity disastrously. It was a disaster, they said. By taking for granted the transfer of the concept of Son of God onto a pre-existing Messiah. That's what they did. They took for granted that Jesus was alive before he was alive. <laughs> Therefore, that he came into the womb from outside. That's very pagan. I read there that 13-year-old, 14-year-old Mary had a baby. Did you read that? Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful story. Again, as, as I was translating, I thought how beautiful this is. 
How simple is it? Here they are engaged to be married and she's found to be pregnant. Whoa, family crisis. What are we going to do? It, it's so real and so down to earth. But once you pervert it by saying, well, he was really alive before he was born, what then? You've moved into paganism. Anyway, there are all sorts of quotes in my Jesus book at the end. Colin Brown at Fuller says similar things. He says to be called son of God in the Bible means you are not God. Thank you, Colin <coughs> Brown. He's still out there in Pasadena, Fuller Seminary. Okay, well, I'm going to go on for that long time. If you want to go deeper into that than Keegan's book, The God of Jesus in the Light of Christian Dogma. But this is common, it should be perfectly common knowledge. Again, chickens don't run for president, you know that. Go and look for the crown jewels. Where are you going to go, Baltimore? No, no. You go to London for the crown jewels. When Americans sing the national anthem, are they singing God Save Our Gracious Queen? I don't think so. This is the level of ignorance at which people are. That's where you start, local newspaper. Get them to answer this question, what does the creed of Jesus mean in Mark 12? What did Jesus say was the greatest of all the commandments, the one you mustn't get wrong? It's not a Trinitarian creed. Anthony, can you talk yeah. about the divine nature here in verse Yes, uh, That's very right. important. Verse 4. Absolutely. Well, the divine well, nature is the divine nature. Verse God's verse nature. Three. Yes. You've got a nice Greek word there for divine, to do with God, of course. Yeah, you, you all make the yeah. point about uh, the, the divine nature dwelt in Jesus Christ. Yes, is too of course. Nice connected to Course. It's the same sort of the fullness of, of deity dwelt in Jesus, that's in Colossians 2. It's the same word or related word? Uh, it's a related yeah. idea, same idea. This one is the divine nature. But then you always throw in Ephesians 3.19, what does that say? Ephesians 3.19, what does that say? That's a very fine underused verse. And to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, yes. that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Ah, do you hear that? You, Christians, are to be filled up with all the fullness of deity. That's the same as having the divine nature. But they love to quote the one about Jesus, who was full of deity. That's Colossians 2, 7, am I right? 2, 9. 2, 9. Colossians 2, 9 is a favorite. You know, it's a must-see verse. But they don't use Ephesians 319, parallel, written at the same time, in which it says that same fullness of deity, fullness of God, should be dwelling in you. That's the divine nature that comes through God's Spirit. So you're supposed to be like Daddy, like your Father. That's an easy idea. It's going to take some work and, and uh, seriously. So we will have God's holy nature. We're not going to be yes. gods. No, no, we're no. We're going to become God no. as we were talking No, so. but we have it now, though. Armstrong, you see, had a way of pushing everything into the future. He said, you couldn't be born again. False. <clears throat> false. Any Armstrong people out there, that is absolutely false. Herbert Armstrong said, you couldn't be born again until the resurrection. That's false. Peter said, you have been born again, and you better desire the milk of the word. You're a baby. So that was wrong in the system. We are now partaking of the divine nature, and of course, in a greater degree, once we're perfected at the resurrection. But we can't say, well, all that's fine for the future. No, no, it had better be happening now. Especially the colossal error that we all swallowed, by the way. That's what brought me out of the movement about 1972. I began worrying about this born again thing. And we had a crooked, twisted way of fiddling with the Greek words. Beware of the amateur, by the way. I'm going to write to the journal that's coming to an end. That's a, a magazine circulates amongst the Armstrong groups I want to write to them, tell them my story, that I was there 14 years. And I want to find a subtle way of saying, you know, there is a place for the scholar. Now, scholars are not always right, I don't mean that. But, you know, when you're a real amateur, you don't want to be talking about Greek words. And we did, we, in Colossians 2, 16, we said, let the church judge you on Sabbath keeping. What? Nobody with a modicum of Greek understanding would ever try that. But Herbert did, same with the way international. I was just on a... a, a a very good report on what they were up to. Dr. Weevil had no knowledge of Greek at all. And yet he would say, the Greek said it. Watch out. In no other field do you tell people what to do. The man, the linesman that repaired the line that put the power on, I don't tell him how to do that. I don't know about that. At least if you've got people who are equally truth-seeking, the one with a little bit of extra tech knowledge might have something to say. Oh no, I just got my strong concordance in my King James Bible. 
This is ignorance. Let's not let's not do that. Anthony, yes. uh, Peter goes on to talk about yeah. adding to your faith yes. a lot of what yes. we call ethics yes. and morals. Really. Yes. And what's interesting to me, your story, your yeah. 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 and yourself, and people like yourself, yes. like that book you reviewed, the cult yeah. that snapped, people who are caught up in mm -hmm. very immoral, mm -hmm. unethical mm -hmm. cults. Yes. A, a lot of people mm -hmm. leave because their ethics and moral mm -hmm. compass, mm -hmm. compass mm -hmm. takes over. So yes. mm -hmm. is, it, is it right to say that, and by reading verse 5 mm -hmm. here, that faith is not intrinsically tied to the ethics and morals of... Oh, it certainly is that too, I'm sure, as part of knowledge. I, I wouldn't because, separate Right, because you like, are, a true example of that, although yeah. we're not to verse 5 here, but... Yeah. Is the Mormons? Yes. The Mormons are the most um, family oriented, That's right. you know, helpful, wonderful. Exactly. You right. You know, I, I'm not people, saying I'm not saying the faith. They believe they're going to be gods. Right. You know, not same, same with the JW. Congratulations. Same yeah. with the JW. Yeah. Uh, I'm yeah. not saying obviously that the faith doesn't have ethics and morals. Oh, of course it, it does. It's a but, package. But here it's an interesting yeah. economy or an interesting. A difference here where it says add to that faith yes. ethics and morals. Yes, one of the things you add is knowledge, isn't it? What among right. the things that Everything you add? Knowledge. Can we read the verse first? Let's read <laughs> it. We haven't read that. We haven't got so, that, but let's get to it. That is a whole section. That's right. Add this to this to this. Well, okay. Read. Okay. We'll, we'll, well verse five. Did we do verse five? No. Yeah. Well, we're supposed to apply no. then for this very reason in verse five. Applying all diligence, this is not a half-hearted, sloppy approach, this is diligence in your faith. So you've got your faith, you, you are a Christian, you're a believer, a true believer, then you are to supply moral excellence, of course, excellence. And to your moral excellence, you add more knowledge. Wow, there's the knowledge again. In, and your knowledge, then in verse 6, somebody read verse 6 for us. And in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness. Mm -hmm. And to godliness, brotherly affection, mm -hmm. to brotherly affection, love. Mm -hmm. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're well, back to knowledge again. So it does say, if these qualities are in you, I think, is it, where is that verse? If eight. You, eight. Eight, yes. Mm -hmm. Verse eight. If these qualities, they've added the word, they've got that italics there. Mm -hmm. the qualities, you see, tends to turn it only into ethics, you see? Qualities as just being a good person. That's not wrong, but the qualities include knowledge. The whole thing is a package. It's when you dichotomize it and say, these yeah, are yours. These are, all these things are yours. And in you. In you, including the knowledge. I'm stressing the knowledge because that's the bit that we didn't get in church at all well. We all believed in ethics in some way, and I'm so glad that Michelle raised the issue of the Mormons. The Mormons have many good ethical standards and qualities, they do. But any child can see that the basis, their knowledge, is, is, is harebrained, demonic actually. So you can, you can be a jolly good chap. Atheists can be very good people. So what lies behind that knowledge is key. Well, people, that, that's why yes. I go back to your experience. Yes. Well, you were such good people that you eventually, yes. your ethic, your natural yeah. ethical and moral yeah. compass, which yeah. is, I think, what Peter's touching on here. Yes. I don't um, think we were such good people, but we were, we claimed to have well, some standards. Good. We you, were. You know how I'm using good. Yes. Right? No, yeah, well, that's yeah. right. Actually, what got me out was the born again thing. <clears throat> it was a matter of Greek. When he said, Armstrong said we could be begotten now, but not born. That's false. I wrote to the people in Oxford, all over. I said, wait a minute, what about that? And the fact is that you have to be born again now. You want the proof? Peter said, in the first book, having been born again, that's Christians now, you're to seek the milk like a baby. That's not a Jesus. In the Armstrong system, you see, the system was wrong. It was the knowledge that was wrong. Quite apart from the ethics, which turned out to be disastrous. So watch out for the knowledge. It was crooked. 
He didn't know that. He didn't have enough skill to do that. When you're a businessman like that, you don't go around telling people what Greek words mean. So I customarily used to say to the students, if you come up with something which nobody in any commentary for 2,000 years ever imagined, and you know nothing about Greek anyway, you could be wrong. You're not that great that you can correct the world on no good information. Anyway, that, I'm glad you made, mentioned that, because those Mormons do have good <coughs> standards. And a lot of people do. A lot of good and people. And a lot of people are drawn yeah. to that whole family concept. They have all these outreaches That's right. to help you know, of course they do. Yeah, what does that call it? Bo like bombarded that. with love or something? Yeah. I don't know. I, never read. I just know yeah. Mormons. I have friends. <laughs> yeah. it's this not makes not the whole exercise but, uh, challenging. When you learn what they really believe. Yeah. It's well, it's rather scary because the guy who read the tablets, you know, was really demonic. There was an angel showed up and he was reading Greek hieroglyphs without any knowledge. That's very bad. But you want to challenge that with the Mormon because that's their basis and they're going to have spirit babies on planets. All of that is harebrained nonsense. Doesn't destroy the capacity of a human being to be good, by the way. You see, that's the most interesting. He was given glasses to read. <laughs> Ma magical glasses. Magic. Well, I'm serious, that's a story. He was given Yeah, was there some gold plates they dug up? Oh, yeah, those yeah. are the ones he's talking about. Mm -hmm. And with that, a pair of magical glasses to yes. read because he couldn't obviously read. Yeah, makes sense. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, Joseph Smith. That makes sense to me. I think I'm going to go. <laughs> you make um, a choice. Okay. I just want to say that this is actually a scripture, though. This yeah. is this is like a, a blueprint. This Isn't is a it? map. This is what a Correct. Christian life. Should that's be right. About. It's powerful, isn't it? It's very systematic. It's good writing because he's got this well thought out. But he's a student of Jesus. And he is combating the Gnostic Absolutely. views every time he keeps mentioning this true knowledge because Absolutely. the Gnosticism is growing at that time. Absolutely right. right. right Tom, sure. Absolutely. Absolutely, because Paul speaks about avoiding the false Gnosis. Gnosis falsely so-called. The devil is forever trying to interfere with the faith. Paul name. does the, yeah. the comparison of Gnosis yes. and Phenos. Yes, yes. In the Lashings. Yes. Well, so an epic gnosis is the, is the letter of John. So yep. the second John. Is. He doesn't always use epignosis for good knowledge, but he can stress the complete knowledge with epignosis. He also wants us to have gnosis. But there's a false gnosis, right? Exactly right. All of which is uh, interesting as we make our way through this. And tangle. as you build on each of these. Yeah. You know, if you have self-control, yeah. but you don't have moral yeah. excellence, or you have perseverance, but yeah. you don't have the knowledge, you know, it all seems like you need every one of these you really do. Uh, virtues or qualities. Yeah. And, of course, they all build up to what? Love. They all are summed up in love. Paul said the same thing. This is a very high bar, isn't it? It's like uh, the high jump at school. We used to do three foot six, if we were good at it. But then... We were told that you should be able to jump six feet by hurling yourself over the bar, right? As I translate the New Testament again and spend hours, you know, word by word by word, hearing the words of Jesus, I think this is a tough teacher, this one. He's pretty uncompromising. If you cause people to stumble, it would be better to be put into a lake with a millstone around your neck and drown. What? Goodness, this is fierce stuff. I tell you, my, my yeah. mom was just saying uh, yeah. that the, yeah, the knowledge thing is repeated uh, mm -hmm. and again, and it's interesting that it ends in an emotion. Yes. Love. Well, I don't think love is just an emotion. <laughs> it's not just an emotion. Love is a quality which includes truth, as well, you've often pointed feeling, out. Right? Yeah, but not, not love. Not only, it's yeah. the active. Yes. Love yes. is yes. Okay. activity. Love of the truth, and you have pointed out that one of the qualities but, but, but of love is But it's not truth. devoid of emotion. No. Yeah, that's no. right. Yeah, that's right. Have, it is yeah, emotional, right. but it's not yeah. only. Yeah. 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 It's, uh, that's and one question. Um, uh, useless. Can Anthony elaborate on yeah. the implications of useless in yeah. that context? And I say useless where can we For if these qualities, if these qualities, the qualities we commented on, that's in italics there, if all of this list of things, including knowledge, right? I don't think knowledge is really a quality. 
So the, the qualities is not a good translation there. If all of these items he's been listing are in you, then uh, in the true knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ in verse 8, the one who lacks these elements, these items, is blind. No, you skipped the, in verse 8. Okay. If you have these items, okay. they render you neither useless yes. nor unfruitful. Okay, I got it. That's the parable of the soul. Mm. You're bound to produce fruit. If you've got all of this in lined up, then you produce the fruit. Otherwise, you're fruitless, pointless, in vain. The basis is the key here. Why does Jesus begin his ministry by saying, repent and believe in the gospel of the kingdom? This is the point we haven't got over to the public yet, right? You start with the kingdom gospel. That's God's plan. You get in line with that. You develop all of these qualities. If you do that, then you will not be useless. Otherwise, you'll be in vain. <clears throat> So you can have all the qualities of what you call love and all that stuff, but if you haven't got the basis of the kingdom, that's why Jesus said, if, you, if they don't understand the kingdom, they can't repent. What? That's fascinating. It's Mark 4, 11. That's fascinating. This rabbi there, standing by the lake, or in the boat, preaching, you know, with the effect of the sound across the water, to the crowds on the shore, he's saying, look, you can't repent until you believe in the kingdom. Oh, you can stop beating your wife, that's a good idea. You can stop being an out and out drunk, that's a great idea. But you can't repent. Only when they get the kingdom message and believe it, can they repent. Because Jesus says, Mark 1, 14, 15, repent and believe the kingdom. Not repent and stop beating your wife, that's important too. Not repent and stop being a drunk, that's important too. Not repent and give up your outside of marriage sex, that's very important too. But repent by believing in God's kingdom plan, which is you ruling the world with Jesus. That's huge. I didn't know anything about it in the Church of England. We didn't know. We vaguely believe we'd go and play harps on pink clouds when we die. That's false. That's a very clever diversion, isn't it? And, and it's interesting that um, uh, yeah. the useless or unfruit, unfruitful, yes. Yes. which uh, sounds like a, uh, an action, Yes, like of course. working. Of course right? it is, yes. It's interesting though, if you go to the JWs, yeah. we're talking Mormons, JWs, yes. they're very active. Yes. They're very fruitful. They're, Zeal without knowledge. And they come they have converted millions. Yeah, so sure. it's an interesting thing in this yes. world that it's the text that you used before. Zeal excitement without knowledge is pointless. Yet they're converting millions. Well yes. in verse eight here, I mean it's it's, it's double negative, so if you say yeah. it's neither useless yes. nor unfruitful, yes. if you change it, well, if you're not useless, then you're useful. Yes. He, he wants you to be useful of course. and fruitful of course. In, in the knowledge, but... In the, no, in the knowledge, which, which is... In the knowledge all of Lord Jesus Christ, yes. I think, meaning... Which was the the whole thing. And the living the knowledge, sharing the knowledge, yes. not just having the knowledge. <laughs> of course. But, because otherwise you wouldn't be fruitful if you just had the right. knowledge and you believed it and that right. was it. I mean, no. There's an implication. That's, that's not good at all. Exactly right. That's why it's hard to to knock the yes. door knockers yes. when it comes to that aspect. Of hard to what? Hard to knock? I, the... I will use a double one. <laughs> it's hard to knock the door oh, knockers okay. when it comes to this because they're, yes. they're very useful. They're yes. very useful. Yes. I'm doing a Air. You know, if they would ever come to my house when it wasn't a Saturday morning and I had rollers in my hair and I, or something, they don't ever come at some time when I feel You're like ready. I have a minute to sit down and actually talk to them. It's always some time I'm running out the door. <coughs> but I want to read what's on here. Um, mm -hmm. We've got um, Child of the 80s, literature placement. Consequently, useless being rendered inactive yeah. mm -hmm. has morphed into a cultural parlance with a pejorative Something. implication for yeah. describing inactive JWs. Yes. Mm -hmm. so maybe oh, I see. Well, from their angle, if you come out of the movement, you are fruitless and inactive. But their presupposition is that that system is right. You've got to get to the system with them. As with us, we had to have somebody say, the system is wrong. Your born again thing is wrong. Start and get that right. Now, of course, the parable of the sower is key here. You can't produce fruit with the wrong seed. And the seed is the message of the kingdom, Matthew 13, 19. It's a very well-constructed system, by the way. Jesus is an intellect. 
He's got a system. He's not sort of throwing out platitudes. Not at all. He's a brilliant rabbi and they killed him for it. They couldn't handle it because he was so critical of their system, wasn't he? Do the Mormons believe Jesus and Satan are brothers? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. yes. We don't need to go. No. The answer is yes, we'll move on. That's right. Um, once we've repented by believing in the kingdom, we yes. must continue to progress in gaining these qualities. Yes. Otherwise, we do not have the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus. Yes, himself. absolutely. That's it's a package. That's the Hebrew mind, as I was told at the Hebrew University the year we married, 1974, I was at Jerusalem University, and the professor said, the Hebrew mind grasps a totality. It doesn't cut everything out all the time. We tend in the West to be one, rather too analytical, it's a whole package, but it must have the fruit from the seed, you think, right? And it doesn't. Ask your local pastor at the evangelical church. He doesn't do the gospel of the kingdom. How do I know that? Because he never uses that phrase. These are glaring <coughs> omissions in the system. God is the judge of all this ultimately. He'll make the final decision. I get that. But for the moment, we're trying to listen to the words of Jesus carefully and as our Correspondent there said, Peter did that very well. Okay, so what have we got? Verse he who nine. lacks it, verse 9, who's going to read verse 9 for us? I'll read it. For mm-hmm. he who lacks these qualities is blind or short sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Yes, that's interesting, isn't it? He's forgotten the huge transition that is conversion. <coughs> blind, he's become blind. And Luke 8 13 says that some people believe for a while. That's not once saved, always saved. Jesus makes it much harder. Some people believe for a while. And then, when the worries of life, temptations of wealth, and other things come in and chokes the word. The farming metaphor is brilliant there. Chokes it. Can fall into sin again. Can fall into sin. Then you give up. They give up, but they were believers. They cease to be believers. That's a lot tougher proposition than just that's it. Put up my hand. I got saved. Nothing I would do could alter that. That's just false. I cannot be right. Okay, so, unfruitful, parable of the sower, Matthew 13, 19, Barbara. the message of the kingdom. Let's do next, verse 10. Therefore, brethren, mm. be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling mm-hmm. and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. Okay, let's stop there and comment on diligent. Didn't we have that word already? Mm-hmm. In verse 5, mm-hmm. we had applying all diligence. Yes. You have to work at this. It's not a casual, I do this, you know, when I feel like <coughs> it. Diligence, and then diligent again in verse 10. Knowledge is three times in this pa- passage. In this way, then, in 11, here's the goal. The entrance into the kingdom of the age to come, not eternal kingdom. That word eternal is a wonderful example of fog language. Yes, it's eternal life. But it's much more specific. It's the life of the age to come from Daniel 12, verse 1. Many of those sleeping in the dust of the ground tells you what they're doing, where they're doing it, will arise some to the life of the age, the Chaye Olam. And the rabbis said correctly, if it's the life of the age, it must be the life of the age to come, of course. And Jesus then, being a rabbi, picks up the same language. So he talks about the life of the kingdom, the kingdom of the age to come, which belongs to our Lord, that's Adoni, my Lord, Messiah, our Lord, Messiah, and Saviour. So how many people are saviors? They're discussing that in the journal of the uh, Church of God people. Well, there are two. God is the saviour and Jesus is too. But there are other saviours in Nehemiah who were other human leaders. So... Relax, you can have the big saviour and you can have lesser saviours. That's all right. Yes. In verse 10, I have written from some other time we studied this. Yeah. His calling is the invitation into the kingdom. Yes, like absolutely. Said. absolutely. And choosing you yes. is your election. Yes, certainly. So what's the difference? Really? Well, it's the two sides of the coin, isn't it? The calling, as we said, comes from God and we react in different ways. It's both things have to happen. You can't, in, in no Bible verse, can one often say everything one wants to say, right? You have to put it all together. That's what the but rabbis did. Is the did. calling maybe more sort of Invitation. general to, to people, but your, yes. your calling or choosing you right. 
is that I want you well, sure, to why not? listen to yes. me. He wants everybody, as somebody pointed out, he wants everybody to be saved. Throws it out, yes. Personal. Yeah. I don't know uh, exactly the, the detail of that, but I do, I do know we need diligence and we're trying to enter the kingdom of the age to come, which belongs to the Lord, Adoni of Psalm 110, one, and Saviour, Rescuer, who is Jesus Messiah. It'll be abundantly supplied, isn't that great? Not just creep in, abundantly supplied, hugely open, well done, good and faithful servant. That is very powerful. Uh, just on the election, yes. uh, since we haven't really done a video on this because it's yeah. a big Calvinist thing, yes. right, the election. So yeah. what's your, your thought on the election? Uh, you know, sometimes yeah. uh, believers are talked about as having been chosen, yes. predestined. Mm -hmm. So what's, how would you define election? In, in general. Well, election is simply God's selection of you. That's quite clear. The famous text is many are called, but few are elect. That's the same way, eclecti. There are, the invitation is going out massively, but not everybody is responding. And How you, that is, is... And then you have, history, he has history. chosen you before. Yes. The foundation of, of course. the world, so there's... That's right. Why not? I don't think that God had to arrange all the marriages from before Genesis to, to create you. I, I, I would imagine that's not so. What God has in mind is a group of people, and as they turn out, He deals with them. Everybody is supposed to be saved. First Timothy 2 5, that's quite clear. Not everybody is saved. That shows that Calvinism is false, because it's God's will that everybody gets saved. That's what it says. However, we know that some people don't get saved. Well, how did they thwart God's will? Free will, their own choice. So we do have free choice within certain limits. I don't have a choice to be president of USA. I'm a green card person. That's hard. <coughs> but I do have choices in many other areas. I don't think this is so hard. Although I don't think you can define this mathematically. You know, it's, there's a certain amount of flexibility that has to happen. I can live with that. Okay, so there's the object then, there's the goalpost, not kicking the ball as high as you can to the air, not but heaven. getting it through, not heaven, heaven in the Bible is nowhere the destination of the dying, J.T. Robinson from Kevin. Heaven is not the age to come. It's not the heaven, no. Where paradise is, is and paradise will be on the earth, renewed. It's Remember me when you come in your kingdom, the thief knew this, on the cross while he's dying, Please, Jesus, remember me when you come bringing in your kingdom. I'm telling you right now, don't have to wait till then. You will indeed be with me in the paradise. So the paradise is the kingdom. And so also in Revelation 2 verse 7. Actually in heaven there's no ages at all. Well, of course, there's a lot of people that think that the kingdom is now. Yeah. That once you become a Christian, yeah. in the evangelical world, once you mm -hmm. accept Christ and become a... Christian, then you're living the kingdom. You're saying, yes. you're good. The There's some truth in that. We should be living the kingdom lifestyle. There's no question about that. But the majority of people need to hear about the future kingdom yeah. because they've never heard of it. Heaven has swallowed up the kingdom of God gospel. There's so much out there in the literature which confirms what we're saying here. Okay. <coughs> Otherwise, we'd be scared. <coughs> okay, so then 11. I want you always to be, I, I want to be. Uh, I will always be ready to remind you. That's interesting. Preaching then is reminding, isn't it? Bible reading that we do on our own is a reminder. I mean, I learned a lot from the hour and a half or so I spent not translating this yet, but uh, doing it this morning. I thought, this is amazing stuff. And what you have contributed to the study with your comments only expands it, clarifies it. So Peter is reminding us then of what? Of these things. Even though... You already know them. Wow. You already know this, but you have to be reminded, that makes some sense. And have been established in the truth which is present with you. Oh, truth can be with you. How about the Word of God was with God, right? Truth with you. And Paul in Galatians 2 7 wants the gospel to remain with you. The gospel. So when people say, well, in the beginning was the Word, capital W, the Word was with God, they say, there you go, two persons. We then launched into the idea that there were two gods in the God family. How bad was that? You can't have two gods. That's paganism. 
So, uh, this is clear. The truth of the gospel of the kingdom, all goes with it. The whole package is with you in Hebrew thinking. When was your truth last with you? We don't say that. You could go to have tea with the queen. I understand that, with the queen. I got that. But we don't talk about our truth being with us, but they do in Hebraic thinking, in the mind of a Hebrew. Truth is with you. That was Galatians 2.5. Thank you. Galatians 2.5. I've got a couple of verses off there. Galatians 2.5. Just read that for us, please. 2.5 of Galatians. But we did not yield in subjection to them for even an hour, so that the truth of the gospel would remain with you. Isn't that great? The truth of the gospel. We didn't yield to those guys, not for a second did we let them in, so that the truth of the gospel could remain with you. Pros is the preposition there. Pros, same as in John 1. Face to face. Face to face is wrong. <laughs> Why? Because the truth isn't face to face with you in English. Look, uh, Sarah said a good one. You said because the word's not a face. No, that's good. The word face. Doesn't have a face. <laughs> that's a good line. Everybody listen to that one. The truth is not face to face with you in English. That's nonsense because truth doesn't have a face. However, in Hebraic thinking, you can have the truth as your baby. It's a thing that's with you. God's project, his word, all of that's clear. But this takes instruction. So you start young with your children when they're 8, 9, 10, and they're looking at a career in the Bible business, maybe. Then they can learn all this early. Save a lot of time. Face to face. Thank you. Galatians 2, 5. I got the verse wrong. Galatians 2, verse 5. They're struggling to allow the gospel of the truth to remain with the people. Paul is insistent that happens. Why? Because they're going to be lost otherwise. That's awful. Okay, what else? Uh, Twelve. Twelve. That was twelve. Thirteen. Who, who, who read thirteen for us? I consider it right, mm -hmm. as long as I am in this earthly yes. willing, to stir you up by way of reminder. Yes. Fourteen. Uh, I know. Knowing that before long I will be laying aside my tent, mm -hmm. just as Lord Jesus Messiah made Clear to me. Yeah, so he's about to die. He's going to lay aside his tent. Oh, well, I thought that meant he was going to stop working. No. Because it was a tent. Oh, oh no. No, that Peter. Paul. No, that's Paul. Peter wasn't a tent. Oh, Peter. Peter didn't make tents. No, no, he's going to well, die. Peter. No, no. No, no, he's going to die. And you are. When you die, your current body is going to rot. And you're going to be asleep until the resurrection. So that's not a problem. He knew he was going to die. This says earthly dwelling. Yes, I don't know that's pushing it a bit. His tent. His tent. tent is more than His dwell. Dwell. Yes. Well, they added the just... word earthly in both yes. verses. It's yes. in italics. Yes. <laughs> so they're push, pushing your tent. 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 Yes. Yes. Tabernacle. Dwelling. Tent. Is it the same as one fourth? John one. All right. Let's Yes. Wisdom or the word became Messiah of Jesus and tented among us. Pitched his tent. Pitched his tent. I love that. Keep going, we'll get this chapter done. Mm. Psalm 115. And I will also be diligent that at any time after my departure, yes. you will be able to call these things to mind. Yes. That's why he's writing this down. Are we doing it? That book, miraculously, is still before us in multiple numbers of translations and commentaries. So I want you to have this information preserved. That's scripture, isn't it? <coughs> I think Peter is probably the one who got the books together. He probably didn't get the book of Revelation together, had probably not written. Otherwise, he's getting the canon of scripture. You would. I, I would like that to happen, wouldn't you? So you can have after he's gone. Peter and Paul were both together in Rome. Yes, yes. Good point. Collaborating your thinking on that. <laughs> Without the canon of scripture, you have no chessboard to play chess on. I've got a lady corresponding with me who doesn't like the book of Revelation because she says that Jesus said it was all going to happen quickly and it didn't, so she doesn't like that. Well, Luther said the book of Revelation is not a Christian book. Now, he changed his mind a little bit towards the end, but early, it's not a Christian book. Jesus is not mentioned in the book of Revelation. You haven't got off the step one here. That's Luther. Wow. Who's, who's the lamb? The and the horse. revelation gives the resurrection. And who's the lamb and who's the... Yeah. Mm. He was 
transported into the day of the Lord. I think that that's the Lord's day, the dominical day. He's envisioned. And when you're standing on the brink of the kingdom, you see all of this prophecy fulfilled. The book of Revelation is about 450 allusions and citations from the Old Testament prophets. Yeah, really. Jesus knew that well. I mean, how well do you know the book of Zephaniah? You can be more like Jesus by getting the book of Zephaniah under your belt. Because he's so filled with all that that he comes up with the book of Revelation. And you say you don't believe that, then you're not a Christian. I'm telling people that up. You've got to be a believer. We can't have an honest discussion if you think that the millennium is not part of Scripture. Well, so what else don't you believe in? Watch out. You've done away with the chessboard. Can you imagine a soccer field with no lines on it? <clears throat> it's chaos. Okay, so he's wanting you to have this. I think Ernest Martin used to say this was a good indication that Peter was instrumental in getting the canon together. That's, that's a good idea. I want you to have all this when I have left, when I depart, and you do, when you die, you depart. You're not there anymore. I get it. You were there the day before, now you're gone, you've departed. So sure you're departing. The question is, you were to depart and be with Jesus. That's what Paul said. However, in the same book he said, if by any means I can attain to the resurrection of the dead, that's in Philippians, both things. In Philippians said, I'm departing to be with Jesus. Yes, but you didn't read 3.11 of Philippians, I think it is, which says, if by any means, Paul said, I can attain to the resurrection of the dead, which is at the second coming, at the parousia. Teach the children to rivet the parousia to the resurrection. You pull those apart, you're in chaos. And it is chaos out there. Did I get the right verse of Philippians 3.11? And we got that, and just make sure we got that on the record right. Philippians 3.11, mm -hmm. is it? I might have got a verse off. Oh, the 10th thing? 3.11, about, if by any means I may attain... Yeah. 3.11? Mm -hmm. Just read that for me, please. 3.11. In order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Yes. In the Greek day you have an additional little word. It's an exanastasis. It sounds like a prior resurrection, super resurrection. It may be. If by any means I can attain to heaven when I die, no, of course not. Never imagined it. The exanastasis, the out-resurrection of the dead, that's what Paul is thinking about. And died for it, right? Nero couldn't handle him. Chopped his head off. That doesn't suggest that Christianity is very popular in this system, does it? Those awful Pharisees. You get bored translating, you say, you can't bear what's coming next. You know, they're picking corns of grain on the Sabbath, and those awful Pharisees said, look what they're doing. You shouldn't be doing that. And he says, haven't you read your Bible, my dear people? What did David and his companions do? They went in and ate the showbread, which is only permissible for the priests. David was a type of... Isn't that beautiful? But religion is an ugly thing when it points fingers all the time. <laughs> you awful people, how dare you have... Eaten, eaten grain on the Sabbath. Whoa! What about the sheep? Got a sheep, it falls in a ditch, Jesus said. Wouldn't you grab it and pull it out on the Sabbath? Of course you would. So the Son of Man, then he really drove them crazy by saying the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath also. What? No, he's blaspheming, claiming to be God. I mean, it's just impossible struggle. So they killed him. Ignominiously. Don't forget that. This is a huge epic tragedy. Huh? Ignore what? What, what, what? Ignominious. Ig ignominious means disgraceful. Ignominious, disgraceful death. Remember right? your audience. <laughs> disgraceful death. It's awful to be nailed to a cross, isn't it? All right. Just, just before we leave this. Yeah, we'll leave it at 15, I think. I'm very glad that the idea of being useful came up. Yes. And was highlighted because um, I'm battling the idea that silence is okay, mm. whether it's to do with abortion or your faith yes. and so on. And people seem to think that, well, as long as I believe these things, then that's okay. Yeah. So, yeah. what about the question, how useful are you? <laughs> you know, yeah. as, as the new year approaches, that yeah. might be a good way to evaluate ourselves. <laughs> how, how useful are you? I think so. We want workers. <laughs> We're, yes. 
we're working want, at this we night and day. Door knockers? We want more workers. Door knockers? <laughs> no, we want useful people. <laughs> Yeah, that's the remark about the harvest is great, he observes, but there are a few workers. There aren't enough workers, so pray to God that more people will become active, more active, right, into the harvest parable of the sower again. Something like that. The best verse on all of that is Acts 17, 17. Just look at that a moment. Acts 17, 17, easy to remember. Acts 17, 17. What was Paul doing on a given day? In 16, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, this is an interesting verse, his spirit was being provoked within him, right? It was driving him crazy. <laughs> he was absolutely so obsessed he couldn't stand it. Very emotional. Very emotional. His spirit within him, as he was observing the city full of idols. He drove him nuts. He drove him I can't, you know, I can't stand it. Well, I Jerusalem. tend to think that as we see all these steeples up, what is that all about? I just hope and pray some of these people will, will rethink. Anyway, 17 says this. So, what did Paul do? He was reasoning in the synagogues. He went to the magazines. He went to churches. He reasoned. The way to reason with people is to say, wait a minute, this creed, the greatest commandment, folks, have you thought about that? Is that a Trinitarian creed? Or is it a Unitarian creed? Which is it? If they say it's a Trinitarian creed, they're saying Jews are always Trinitarians. What? I thought the Brits did God Save the Queen and not the Star Spangled Banner. In your paraphrase, you have debated, by the way. Yes. He debated in this. It is. It's a very intellectual word. He, t he talked to them. I'm sure he was full of emotion, too. That's fine. We've been through that. So he debated with them. He reasoned with them in the synagogue with the Jews, and the God-fearing Gentiles. These were people who were attracted to Judaism, right? They loved the Jewish faith. They were Gentiles by birth. He argued with them too. And also, where else was he? In the Agora, the marketplace. That's the internet, folks. Down on the street. That's exactly what I was going to say. Were you? That's Isn't the it? the internet of the time. It's down on the street. It is. Talked about it really is. People come by so how much of your day do you spend arguing the text of Scripture on the internet? Yeah. Spanish has discutia and the synagogue. Discutia. Discutia. Discussing. And he, what's the Greek word? What is the Spanish word? Spanish word for the marketplace? Synagogue. Oh, see, yeah, someone else. The marketplace. The marketplace. What's the Spanish word for that? 1717. Yeah. La Plaza. Oh, there you go. He's out on the plaza arguing scripture. Of course. the plaza? Now, I see that people have different capacities to do this. You know, you have to earn a living. You can't spend eight hours a day, but we should do some of it because it really gets very interesting. You learn more about who a person is by their reaction to the truth. Very often, it's nothing to do with an argument. It's to do with who they are. Some people are so fiercely independent, they've just got their strong and corns, and nobody's going to tell them anything else. That's arrogance and ignorance. So it's a fascinating exercise. 1717, isn't that beautiful? Every day with those who happened to be present on Facebook. That's my translation. <laughs> I love what the yeah. philosopher said. What? what an amateur. Yes. <laughs> what on earth is he talking yeah. about? Talking about the resurrection. Who's this guy? Yeah. Who's this guy? He's talking about this idiot. You heard this guy is amazing. Talking about the resurrection of the dead. And then later on, Paul is confronting one of the big leaders. And the leader says, Paul, if you go on like this, you've got to convert me to Christianity. Yeah. And Paul humorously then says, I wish I could do that, except that I would be happy if you didn't have the same chains on that I've got. Isn't that beautiful? It's so human, so but real. Verse 19, for our day, Barbara, yes. uh, they wanted the teaching he was promoting. Yes. So uh, to your usefulness, mm -hmm. yes. what are we doing to promote ourselves? Yes. And that's Adiopagus, that's Mars Hill, that's a debating center, that's the University of Harvard, you know, mm -hmm. of the day at Harvard. Because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. Yeah. That's a novel idea. They'd never heard of that before. I'll see, that's a place, that's a, that's a real good example where 
the philosophers, the learned. Yeah. They're like, who is this nut? What is he saying? But yet there were probably a lot of people there that were touched by it. And I said, wait a minute, what, this makes sense. Mm -hmm. Well, there absolutely what was. was. What is he talking about? They even get named. Yeah, There's a lady there who got named. Anybody know the name of the lady who was touched by that preaching? Beginning with a D? Damaris. Damaris. Isn't that a pretty name? Damaris was listening, and uh, her name is mentioned right there that in the Mars Hill episode. I bet what attracted a lot of these pagans was the word resurrection. They said, resurrection? Never heard of that. I hear about going to the gods and the... Oh, we've, got to wrap. we've got to wrap it up. Well, we can start at 16 next time. Yes, we we'll start at 16. Anyway, we've got a lot of good stuff there. That debating in the synagogue is a good lesson. And, and the concept of resurrection to a Jew, I mean, there were people in the Old Testament that were sure. raised from the dead. Absolutely. That should be understood. Absolutely. Daniel 12, they knew about it. Okay, we appreciate your interaction, helping us with Bible studies, what you've done. So, God willing, we'll all be around next Sunday for another session. We are doing Q&A on Tuesday? Maybe.